welcome to a new episode of Onco Daily. Today, we have the pleasure to interview Dr. Parikh. Dr. Parikh is a renowned specialist in gastrointestinal cancers, emphasizing treatment for young adults with colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer. She contributes to the NCCN guideline for colorectal cancer and plays a pivotal role in directing clinical trials within the GI oncology program, focusing on introducing innovative treatments for both colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer. Collaborating closely with research teams at MGH Cancer Center, she advances the study of these cancers. Moreover, Dr. Parikh spearheads the Liquid Biopsy Initiative for GI Oncology Group and is recognized globally for her expertise in liquid biopsies. Her work is instrumental in refining these diagnostic tools for assessing residual disease post-surgery, evaluating treatment responses, and understanding drug resistance mechanisms. Beyond her clinical and translational research endeavors, Dr. Parikh is deeply committed to improving cancer care in low- and middle-income countries, focusing on enhancing access, equity, and education in these regions. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Parikh. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I just want to understand a bit about uh, your background and why did you choose to start your career in GI oncology and focusing on young patients with cancer? Um, yeah, that's a loaded question. Um, but I, um, you know, my interest in oncology actually came from a couple of different areas. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why GI specifically. But, um, you know, by way of background, um, I um, had a lot of experience and exposure to various um, low and middle income countries. And even prior to medical school and during medical school, had spent a lot of time um, in developing countries. Um, and at that time, um, was thinking I was destined to be an infectious disease doc and do HIV related work. Um, and just saw so much cancer, um, and, um, saw the kind of suffering inflicted on patients, um, the lack of resources in cancer care, including palliation, um, in low and middle income countries, and um, really started to think a little bit around, um, you know, I think we needed to make move the needle the same way we move the needle with infectious diseases in um, low and middle income countries um, to taking care of patients um, in LMICs with with cancer. And um, I think as I was thinking about that, um, had um, kind of some some family members, um, including a very close. Um, uncle of mine in his 40s that um, kind of died from stomach cancer. Um, um, I get screened regularly myself for I have a risk factor for um, colorectal cancer and sort of get screened myself and have been since my teens. Um, and so I kept sort of thinking about GI cancers as well as I was starting to think a little bit more around, um, around which um, discipline of oncology I was going to go into. And then um, you know, I think ultimately where a lot of things lead you in life is who are the people you meet with, who are the people you work with, who are you inspired by, where is the need? And I was, as I was going through fellowship, once I decided to do oncology, um, you know, when I started fellowship, I was thinking maybe I'll do breast cancer. And then when I went through, um, I liked women's health. Um, but when I went to, got into fellowship, I just really, um, I was drawn to the diversity of GI oncology patients, um, spanning ages, um, spanning races, genders, um, socioeconomic status. Um, I saw the tremendous need to do better with therapies for GI cancers. And, um, and then I really liked the people. I really liked the attendings that were in the space. I liked the, um, the feel of being in the clinic. And then I had a, you know, when I was a fellow, I had a co-resident also um, who unfortunately passed away, who died from stomach cancer when we were co-fellow or not resident and when we were co-fellows. And um, so I think all of these things just led me to GI cancers. And then um, when I started um, at MGH, kind of there was a younger faculty member, a newer faculty member who was... Um, interested in geri oncology and um he was seeing a lot of the um older colorectal cancer patients and um i think at that time um is when we were starting to see this rise of early onset colorectal cancers and 
um, not necessarily by design. I just happened to start getting these patients in my clinic. Um, my colleague wanted to see the older ones, so he was getting them. So by default, all these younger patients, and I was noticing younger and younger, kept coming into my clinic and um, started to just see the unique needs that this patient population had, um, very different than the Jerry needs. Um, Jerry needs are critically important, but um, they're just different from needs of younger patients. Um, so I would say that the young population sort of just happened. Um, and then I liked seeing that patient population. Um, I think there's a certain level of them you know, it's a little, it can be hard. Um, I think you relate to so many of these people sitting in front of you, um, you know, your age, younger with, you know, families and kids and are having their life upended. And so um, I, you know, you feel like, I, I just felt that if there's anything that you can do to just provide that compassionate care, um, and try to go a little bit beyond not, you know, we like to think we do everything for all of our patients, but, you know, definitely felt a little bit of this, if I can lessen the burden of suffering um, in these patients that I just really like feel for um, very uniquely, just given the demographic of my own demographic, um, I, I realized that I, I like that patient population. And then similarly to what I was mentioning before, I mean, I think saw the need to understand why this is happening. And um, I think like some of the areas, the other areas I work on, I th it's one of those things that does keep me up at night, right? Like what, like what is happening here and um, feel very motivated to work along other kind of scientists um, to understand why this is happening um, with eventually, you know, not only being able to potentially risk stratify better and detect earlier, figure out who is the people or who are the people we should be screening. But then, um, you know, can we, can we reverse it ultimately um, somehow? Um, so I think that's like a little bit of a long-winded, <laughs> a little bit of a long-winded answer, but um, I think gives you a sense of a little bit, at least to how I came to that work. No, I completely agree with you. I think our personal stories really affect our choices. Um, the same as you, like my best friend, residency was diagnosed with colon cancer and he's younger than me which was like mind-blowing stage four younger than me right and uh, i can relate and i'm I, i'm sorry you you've been through that and i i know how it feels like it's very hard i'm sorry sorry you went through that as well yeah it's 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 tough when you see um kind of when you when you see like a, a peer and a loved one so yeah exactly and throughout your career you had like tons of publications like more than 200 and what's the secret? Like if uh, I'm a young oncologist starting my career, I want to uh, be prolific academic researcher. Um, what are the tips that you would give to your younger self? Um, to my younger self um, and to you and others, um, I really can't emphasize how much the support network I had, um, both from my peers and colleagues, but also home um, led to, I think, some of my career successes. And like, I mean, certainly I've had many failures too, <laughs> um, but, you know, um, uh, I think it's so, so important to find not only the questions that interest you, I think that's sort of given. I think um, it's really hard to do what we do unless mm -hmm. you're motivated by it. Um, and, you know, people ask me, like, you have so many buckets, like you need to, maybe you should focus, which one are you going to focus on? And I think, like I mentioned before, is um, if you're motivated and the different areas that you're working on kind of keep you up at night in terms of uh, what problems you want to sort of dive into and your areas of inquiry, um, I think the work is no longer work it's a passion right and um it does feel like a little bit of callings uh, of a calling and so find the areas you're passionate about but um you can have the best idea have the most passion but if you're around people that um don't amplify you and lift you up um and are collaborative um 
then it's really hard, I think, to, um, to propel forward. I, you know, I really truly believe in team science and I think obviously together we, we can do better. Um, and I have made decisions, um, around, again, like I mentioned, GI oncology, even I really liked that group. I liked the people I worked with. Um, when I looked at faculty positions, um, I loved the group at MGH and I continue to do and um, continue to love them and um, opportunities may come up to leave. And every time I get drawn to um, the fact that I just really like the people I work with. And so even if better packages with more salary and startup packages, um, you know, may come along, I haven't yet felt propelled to leave because I really like the people I work with. So I would say, you know, find the issues you're passionate about um, and then find the people you like working with. And um, I think that at least sets you up for, for success. During our conversation, you mentioned many times about the people who you work with. And I feel like your mentors affected you a lot and where you are today. Um, what are good tips for people who are starting uh, in academic oncology, how to find the right mentor, how to develop that devel uh, relationship, and how to grow through it? Yeah, um, that's um, such a great question. And it's something that um, now as a mentor myself, um, you know, I'm starting to also, I care very deeply around. And I will say, I think first and foremost, um, I think there has to be a little bit of a just, you could have two different personalities, but there has to be a little bit of a, a connection and a spark, right? It's almost like dating a little bit. Um, I think if you can't see yourself comfortably conversing with someone, even on early conversations, um, and it's doesn't feel right, then I don't even know if it's worth taking the next kind of step, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think as you meet people, I think, first of all, you want to, you know, there's people that you have a, you meet and you're like, okay, this feels right. And there's others where, oh, like, not sure, maybe this is not going to work and I'm not going to pursue anymore. Or there's another one, maybe I need another meeting or two to get a sense of that this is someone I want to work with. Um, so I think get a, get a sense of who they are, talk to other people they've worked with, um, um, that's okay, right? I think um, you aren't, it's it's important to be comfortable with who you're going to have as your primary mentor or mentors. And so get a sense of who else they have menteed, talk to those people. Um, I, before, if I'm asked to do something else, I'm going to collaborate on a bigger project. And even now with someone else, um, I get a sense from people that they worked with, is this someone you you know, want to, should I collaborate with? Or are there any red flags? Tell me what those red flags are. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm, I, I do, I mean, even for me, sometimes um, I, you know, you want to have someone that's going to make time for you. Um, and, um, and how do you know that? I think you get a sense of kind of responsiveness to emails, responsiveness to, to meetings. Um, but I would start with, and then I also think of, you can shift your goals and aspirations over time, but I do think um, it helps mentors if you have a little bit of a sense of what you want to do. Um, I've had people that have sort of come to me of, um, you know, just, it's very different than saying, I think, let's talk about global oncology, right? I have an interest in global oncology done, right? Um, can I work with you? Um, versus like, here's my specific interest in global oncology, or um, or I've noticed, or I saw, I researched that you have done X, Y, and Z. I'm interested in X, Y, and Z that you're working on, or, you know, I see maybe this is not an area you're working on, but it's something I am interested in is this. Um, so I do think a little bit of focus to like, uh, bring to your early conversations with people too also helps the mentor um, because it's harder for someone it's harder to know what to do with if someone's just like I'm interested in GI cancer or I'm interested in colon cancer or I'm interested in global oncology I think those are um, good conversation starters but it's um, a little bit tough to figure out what you do as a mentor um, with that and part of it is is helping people it is okay to be undifferentiated and I think mm -hmm. if you're undifferentiated um, 
then you just come in with flexibility and a willingness to learn and try different things. And then your job as a mentor is to help that person find the areas that they're excited about working on. Um, but I think that needs to be explicitly stated um, rather than just like, I'm interested in this. Um, can you mentor me? Like that, that's a hard, it's hard to know what to do with that. No, I completely agree. I think that's some one of the things I learned the hard ways. Like you have to be specific because like, even if you send general email, like I'm interested in research. Okay. So even exactly. people have research, they will not be interested in giving you the project because like, if you're not interested in it, you're not going to put work in it. These things are hard. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to shift gears. Think... Sorry, Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to shift gears a bit about um, something that we both experience is like um, cancer in young adults. Uh, and I've been asked this question many times, but since it's your specialty and you've seen more more of it, like what do you think is one of the or the main reasons uh, for seeing more and more cancer in younger adults? Yeah, I don't. I mean, it, there is clearly some. You know, obviously you can take the same host, right? And that host um, can have different exposures will affect the host difference. So there's the host micro and uh, host environment. And mm -hmm. I think at least for colon cancer, we're realizing microbiome, location, all of these things matters. You know, why is it rectum more than colon? Rectum is a reservoir. Stool sits. Is that insult causing inflammation? Um, you know, what is driving that inflammation? Um, but I, you know, I don't think we entirely know. There's definitely some hypotheses around you know, even as early as in utero exposure to certain things, antibiotics, um, kind of just sugary drinks, weight changes, um, not just obesity, but actually deltas and weight, um, you know, over time um, kind of causing hits. Um, I was really like interested and a little bit disturbed. I just saw the abstract of the New England Journal Microplastic in coronary plaque article yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to see this, but- No, not yet. It's um it's a little disturbing. So they um it was this this paper that was looking at the composition of um some of the coronary plaques that people mm -hmm. have. And within those plaques, they found like a lot of these microplastics that are kind of in our environment, you know, quite ubiquitously with all the things that we, you know, eat. I I, I heard about it in the news. It's crazy. Now I'm so worried about everything I eat. No, and it's I mean, I was a little bit like, well, some of this stuff, like everything in moderation and um um, but then, like, you see this paper and you're like, oh, wow, they found these microplastics in these plaques. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, so I, you know, it, it, it's all of these, like, you know, which of these things are causing the biggest, it's clearly something in our environment um, that is interacting with, with the gut that is um, causing this. As you know, there's been no clear genomic differences in the, you know, non-hereditary patients. And so... Um, what is that? We don't know. I'm really excited. Um, um, I'm not the lead PI on this, but I'm part of a team that was just announced um, this week uh, for young onset colorectal cancer, a cancer grant challenges, $25 million grant to try to understand oh, wow. Wow, why this is happening. And I'm leading though um, the one of the global parts of the grant um, in India, looking at two states in India that have very different colorectal cancer incidences in young mm -hmm. people and um, trying to do some really deep analysis of um, like a large number of patients in two different states um, that might give us some insight into why is one state like this and why is the other state like this that might give us some learnings that we might be able to apply to a larger patient population as well. Gotcha. All right. Um, those were my questions. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. I really appreciate it. Of course. Best of luck to you and um, such such great work that you guys are doing this. And um, we'll definitely need to catch some of the other podcasts as well. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.